بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبيه الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد so in recent weeks we spoke about a number of supplications we spoke about the most comprehensive du'a we spoke about the most heartfelt du'a then recently we spoke about the most important du'a the du'a that we ask for the most important thing in our life and to reiterate the most important thing in our life is the idea of iman the idea of knowing Allah so the uh, the process of walking on that path to faith is called hidayah guidance so we ask Allah for guidance so no doubt that's the greatest thing in our life iman without iman we have nothing and with iman we have everything when you have Allah you have everything when you don't have Allah you have nothing and last week we saw that the idea in the Quran that when you ask for iman when you come to iman is not enough when you say ihdina sirat al mustaqim or Allah guide us to the straight path the straight path is a highway so the entering the highway or taking the road is not enough but the second thing we ask for along with that after iman you have to realize the real test is to stay on the road not to get on the road many people get on the road and the highway but how many people are driven off the road how many people take exits of their own accord how many people no longer decide decide they no longer want to pursue that road and they go somewhere else See, the most important thing in our life is iman and the second most important thing is to stay on that road the idea of istiqama stay with this knowledge of Allah until the end of our life and that idea appears in the Quran as we shared last week in many many verses one of the most powerful expressions of istiqama we did not mention that last week is the idea where Allah says فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ do not die do not die except in the state of Islam except that you are one who has submitted to Allah in other words this is another way of saying be with this path have Iman and Islam and everything that it entails until the end of your life because Iman and high guidance Hidayah is not that you adopt it once and then you come off the path and then you forget it or you change your mind but the idea of istiqama that's the true test staying with it until your last breath so being with being on this road on this highway until your last breath staying on sirat al mustaqim until your end fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun two verses in the quran have this idea do not die except in the state of islam for one of the verses allah says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu ya ayyuhalladhina amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun O you who believe, fear Allah as He deserves. Fear Allah as He deserves. Haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslim. And do not die except in the state of Islam. This whole verse is giving you iman and istiqama. It's telling you, fear Allah as He deserves. So in other words, we can put it this way. Islam, the most important thing Islam asks us to have is deep faith deep knowledge of Allah haqqa tuqatihi so we are to have deep faith but not only the second thing after that not only deep faith but everlasting faith that's istiqama have deep faith that's haqqa tuqatihi ittaqullah haqqa tuqatihi then everlasting faith until your end is istiqama those are the two things that Allah wants from us it's all linked to iman so it's very very important we always have to keep in mind ask Allah for the most important thing in our life and the second whenever you ask that you have to realize the next step is that you have to stay on that ask Allah for istiqama ask Allah to keep you on the highway keep you on the road now related to that just think about the verse says فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ do not die except in the state of Islam 
What happens when you die? Then what? What happens to your faith, your hedaya? What is there beyond your death? I mean, other than the afterlife, okay, for you there's the afterlife. But here in this path, you are on this road and this highway, and then you pass away and you get to your destination uh, with the permission of Allah. What's next? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Like, what is the idea of everlasting faith? So all of us, or those of us who are old enough, uh, we have children. And we live our dreams and aspirations through our children. So the legacy you leave behind is through your family, your children. So this is very, very important. All the believers, our biggest desire and goal is to leave something good for our children. Our, uh, leave whatever we're building in our lives. We don't want it to disappear with our death. Our entire life effort destroyed with our death. And then those people that we leave behind, our family members and our children especially, they start from scratch. But we, all of us have this powerful instinct to leave something, leave a legacy, leave something for our children. Many people think the most important thing is money. So their whole life they're building these estates for their children, they're building palaces for their children. Unfortunately, many of the rich and powerful in the Muslim world, especially the politicians, this is what they think. They're busy building these mansions and, you know, providing these estates for their children so that when they're gone and in their life they're, they're trying to amass this great wealth, often through corruption and injustice. And we saw a powerful, powerful lesson, life lesson. You know, there are a number of lessons in our lives that are moments that really are for history. And we saw that recently in the country of Bangladesh where this um, ruler, the president, an incredibly corrupt individual from a corrupt family. They were like looting the country and destroying the country, building wealth, creating estates in London and all over the world. Her family and then, you know, prior to her, it was her father and now it was her. Leaving this, you know, what kind of legacy did she leave behind? And look what happened. Allah humiliated her. The people had enough and they forced her out. Now she has nowhere to go. No one knows where she went. We believe she went to India where she was getting her directions. Those were her masters. But this is what happens with tremendous corruption when your goal is not right. But her life and the life of many of these tyrants shows the same thing. These people want to build something for their children. Her father left this legacy for her. This whole country belongs to my child. And all this wealth that I amass is for her. And she was doing the same for her children. But believers, they know. The most, if the most important thing you know is Iman, would you not want that for your children? Of course you would want that for your children. So the believers, part of that istiqamah. So last week we saw you have Iman. When you have Iman, you have to have istiqamah. This week we're going to look at part of that istiqamah is that you have to think about your children. And that dua that we're going to look at is just one word in the Qur'an. It is a dua, but it appears, it's an echo. It appears in various forms in the Qur'an, but that one word is dhurriyati. It's a powerful word. All it means is my children. So in the Qur'an, this word appears in various forms, but it appears primarily through the persona of the great Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and through a series of supplications that he made. And it shows you that he was thinking about this istiqama. But istiqama doesn't end just with you and your life and you dying. But istiqama of Iman demands that now you want your children to carry that legacy on. What is that legacy? Knowing Allah. Nothing more than that. It's not about wealth. It's not about property. It's not about anything else. Because those things are temporary. They come and go. But that Iman, this idea of knowing Allah, you want to pass that to your children. So Allah created this world with one purpose. He created this world as a test. He wants everyone to know Him. And once you know Him, to worship Him. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ We created human beings and the jinn before us only for one purpose, to worship Allah. When that's the purpose of, of, of our existence, the purpose of the cosmos, you know that everything that Allah created in the world will revolve around that. 
So one of the ways that Allah created this is a, it's an amazing system. Allah created a system to carry on that worship of Allah from generation to generation. If you think about what's the best way to carry on like the worship of Allah from one generation to the next. You know, it could have been many, many ways, but Allah created a system of family. And He's created this uh, human beings in pairs, male and female. And He created this natural instinct of attraction between them. And He created this wonderful institution of family where one male unites with one female and then they carry on that legacy and they create more life or Allah creates through them more life under them. So a male and a female gets together. And through those two, more human beings are born. So this system of family was really, you know, the purpose of creation is worship of Allah. Why did Allah create family? To continue that worship of the best way to impart the knowledge of Allah is through this amazing system of family. And that is why Allah created us to come into this world when we're born, knowing nothing, being entirely dependent upon our parents. Why? Because that creates in us this sense of being dependent on someone who provides for us. When we're children, it's our parents. It's our mothers primarily and our uh, fathers. But then as human beings get older, that nature inside us, it teaches us, it makes us realize, well, just like our parents raised us when we were younger, we had nowhere to turn. Now that they we're older, we're also helpless. We're also dependent. We also have needs. And there is a being that's providing for our needs, just like our parents provided. So Allah, you come to the realization of Allah. This system of being dependent and then becoming more and more powerful in your life, more and more strength, this all is there to remind us of Allah Azawajal. And then Allah created this paternal and maternal instinct, parental instinct, to protect our children and to carry on our legacies. That's the best way of imparting, you know, the knowledge of Allah. And the, 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 it's called tarbiyah, the best way of teaching your children to worship Allah. And that's why all the prophets, this was their only concern. They wanted to know Allah, they wanted to invite their people to know Allah, and they made special efforts upon their own children to continue that legacy and that path. And there is none more powerful than the Prophet Ibrahim in the Qur'an. So he said at a number of special moments in his life these powerful words, O oh Allah, my children, my children. So this is the dua we want to focus on. It appears in various duas, but just keep that idea in your mind. How often do you think about your children? How often do you think about your families? Is it something that comes with the beating of your heart? Something that is very powerful? And if your life is not corrupted by distractions, every human being has that within them, this instinct to preserve and protect their children. Uh, it is said that the paternal instinct, someone once said, the paternal instinct is the most powerful natural force in the world, or the parental instinct rather, whether it's father or mother. And really that is the case. This idea of protecting your children either destroys people and destroys countries and you see corruption in, as we mentioned, in certain parts of the world, or is something that's inspiring and amazing and it continues a legacy of worship. So this is something we find in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam in a number of verses, uh, this idea of, if you look in the Quran where Allah repeats this verse or this word, Dhurriyati. So the first verse where Allah gave Ibrahim that station of leadership. Qala inni ja'iluka lin nasi imama. Ibrahim responded, Qala wa min dhurriyati. O oh Allah, what about my children? And then in another portion, and I'll just share with you all the places where Ibrahim mentions this idea, and then we'll look at one of them in more specific detail. When Ibrahim was commanded to leave his wife, Hajar, and their son, Ismail, in the middle of a barren desert, that the age of Ismail at that time was an infancy, young boy. It was part of Allah's test, but part of his plan and his vision to leave 
this legacy in the middle of nowhere in order to build something great. Ibrahim said when he left his child, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati bi wadin ghayri dhi zar'in. My Lord, I have left my children as you commanded, my child as you commanded, in a barren valley that has no vegetation, there's nothing there. Inda baytik al muharram next to your sacred house. Rabbana li yuqimu salah. Oh Allah, this is only so they may establish salah, your worship, prayer to you. Faj'al afidatan minan nasi tahwi ilayhim. Ibrahim said, O oh Allah, make the hearts of human beings inclined towards that region. So Ibrahim, he must have felt leaving his child and his family in a place no one knows. A place that has Allah's house when not a lot of people are visiting. So he makes this dua, Allah, make the hearts of human beings inclined towards that place. And he makes a series of dua, make them, you know, provide sustenance for those people in that barren valley. And who are those people? Right now it's his child. And then in the same instance, the same dua, he says, Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as salati wa min dhurriyati. My Lord, our Lord, make me among the people who establish salah and from wa min dhurriyati and from my children. He's thinking about his children every moment of his life. And that is a lesson for today. Um, and finally, in one verse, another verse unrelated to Ibrahim, where Allah talks about when human being reaches the age of 40, He's talking about the cycle of life. And when the human being in Surah Al-Ahqaf, وَوَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانَ We have enjoined upon human beings to treat their parents with kindness. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ كُرْهًا وَوَضَعَتْهُ kurha. Look at how your mother raises you or bears you with such hardship and raises you with hardship. And this whole process is about 30 months. Until that whole cycle of life continues until that human being, now that child, reaches the age of 40. And now this is an orientation the Quran teaches. What happens when you reach that full adulthood, the age of 40, roughly speaking. قَالَ رَبِّ أَوْ this is the dua that a proper believer who is raised properly should make when he reaches full adulthood or she reaches full adulthood. Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati anamta alayya. Oh Allah, give us the tawfiq to be grateful to you for all the blessings that you have given us. Wa ala walidayya, to be grateful to our parents. Wa an a'mala salihan taruda. And give us the tawfiq to do good deeds that you are pleased with. And then, وَأَصْلِحْ li fi ذُرِّيَّتِ And rectify our children. وَأَصْلِحْ li fi ذُرِّيَّتِ That's another powerful dua that includes this idea of the children. وَأَصْلِحْ li fi ذُرِّيَّتِ So, this idea of children is very, very important. And finally, um, at this most important moment in Ibrahim's life, in the end of Surah towards the middle of Surah Al-Baqarah, at the end of the first juz, Allah shares the story of the Qibla and the building of the house. That's where the first verse I quoted appears. And if we look at just those verses, you'll find this theme. There's so much you can learn from this passage, from different angles. Today we're looking at the idea of your children, preserving your children, protecting your children, passing on that Iman. And if we go through this passage, it's, it's incredible. Um, Allah says, وَإِذْ إِبْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامَ Allah says, we tested and we tried Ibrahim and he passed every single test. And at one moment in his life we said to him, we announced to him, إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامَ Ya Ibrahim, I am going to make you a, the Imam, the leader of all human beings. Great station that no other prophet had before him. The Imam of all human beings. At this powerful, important moment in Ibrahim's life, what were his words? 
He only said one thing. Qala wa min dhurriyati. The only thing he could think about was his children. That's the power of that paternal instinct in his heart, in his mind. And that is, that is why Allah created that instinct. Because that instinct, uh, per, is that instinct to protect and preserve is so powerful. And for believers to protect and preserve the iman is so powerful. There's nothing like that. No other teacher can do that. No other human being who's not related to that child can bring that level of intensity of emotion and live, bring that sincerity to, um, to this notion. So Ibrahim, he says, Wa min dhurriyati. Ya Allah, what about my children? What about my children? Allah says to him, Qala la yanalu ahdi zalimin. He said to Ibrahim, basically the summary was, said to Ibrahim, okay, but my covenant does not extend to those who are unjust. La yanalu ahdi zalimin. So what he was saying, Allah was reminding him that yes, your children certainly will be included, can be included in this honor of being leaders of humanity, of following in your footsteps, but only if they're not unjust. If they adopt a path of injustice, if they are zalimin, then this whole contract, this whole covenant, this whole promise I gave you, that will never apply to them. So Allah was teaching Ibrahim an important lesson. Yes, children follow you in your legacy, in your path, and they get all the rewards and all of the blessings of that path, but only if they follow that path. They have to be guided. If they follow injustice, then it's not an automatic birthright. Then it's not like these are your, you're the chosen people, all your progeny will be saved. As certain people have this idea of being the chosen people, that as long as you're chosen, no matter what you do, Allah will be pleased with you and you have salvation. No. In the Qur'an, the idea is, لا ينالوا عهد الظالمين The covenant does not extend to those who break that covenant, those who are unjust. Then Allah gave Ibrahim the mission to build that house, to build the house of Allah. We face the Qibla all around the world. Every Muslim, their heart is inclined to one place. We have one Qibla, one common direction, one compass. All of us face the east or northeast from here. And that is the sacred uh, valley of Makkah, city of Makkah, the Kaaba, Bayt al-Haram, al-Masjid al-Haram. This great place. Every human being, every believer's heart is inclined to that place. This is the place that our hearts beat towards. This is the place that we want to go to. And the building of that house, this is how it began. Allah shares the story, the building of the house. The first Words from Ibrahim wa min dhurriyati. He was thinking about his children at the time of the building of the house. Then when Allah gave him that contract, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً The next verse, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَا نَتَّخِذُ مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِرَ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْع the next verse contains a contract. Allah gave the specific contract of building this house, a place where people can make salah, people can prostrate and make a, a bow down and, and prostration, rukur and sajda, and make tawaf around. But if you look at the words of the contract, Allah says, وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ We gave this con covenant to build this house to Ibrahim and Ismail. Because of Ibrahim's paternal instinct, his idea, the only thing he could think about was his children at that moment, Allah included the father and the child in that contract. So this house was built by Ibrahim and Ismail. And you only have to think, when they were building the house, you know, how old was Ismail? Was he, you know, old enough to meaningfully participate? Probably not. He was very young. He was a child. But it's symbolic. Ibrahim was concerned about his, his son. That's all he could think about at that moment, his family. And when he was building the house, Allah included him in, the, in that honor. Allah included him in that honor. وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَعِيلَ أَنْ طَهِرَ بَيْتِي To Ibrahim and Ismail, 
who was only a child at the time, we gave this covenant to purify this house for those who will come there. So then, when father and son are building the house, the next verse, or the, after two verses, Allah shares a moving image of a father and son building the house together. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ And when Ibrahim, just imagine when Ibrahim was raising the foundations of the house and Ismail. So this is a verse where Allah is sharing that image. The foundations of the house are being lifted by who? Ibrahim and Ismail, father and son. You can only imagine, the father is very old. And the son is very young. And you can just imagine that image. A very elderly, older person and a very young child, both hand in hand working to build the house of Allah. This is a great lesson for all of us um, in this idea of making dua and thinking about your children. And then when Ibrahim is finished, he builds the house, then he makes a series of dua that we want to look at. These are incredible supplications. And they teach us so much and so many different things. But we'll focus on just this, part, this aspect that we are highlighting today. When you do something amazing and great in your life, at the end of that, you look back and you have a sense of pride. Often you do something, the first thing that you would perhaps say is, Alhamdulillah, praise Allah that we did this. Or, Alhamdulillah, I did it. Or, without Alhamdulillah, I did it. You know, it's amazing. But Ibrahim, the first thing he says, after building the house, nothing like that. He doesn't say, Alhamdulillah, we did it. He's not proud of what he did. He says, Rabbana taqabbal minna, uh, Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiul alim. O oh, our Lord, except from the two of us, what we have done, you are the one who hears and knows everything. So at building this house, Ibrahim, rather than being proud, he's so humble, and this is the attitude he has, oh Allah, accept from us. Now, you could imagine, like, what, what was Ibrahim doing? He didn't do this from his own. Allah told him to do that. He did it. But even in that moment, he's asking Allah for qabul. He's asking Allah to accept from what they did. And the dua that he makes, he uses the plural. That's the point for us. He makes a dua on behalf of himself and his son. He's still thinking about his children. And the, the, the idea I'm trying to share with you here is that great prophet like Ibrahim and all believers, they think about their children every moment of their lives. So in this whole passage from beginning to end, if you look at every moment that Allah shares from Ibrahim, it includes either explicit words or implicitly that concern for his children. So this, all these supplications, he's thinking about his children. Rabbana taqabbal minna. Allah accept from the two of us, both of us, what we have done. Um, and then he says, Rabbana waja'alna muslimaini laka. Oh Allah, and then the next dua that he makes, oh Allah, make us both, and he uses the dual. Why is he using the dual? In Arabic you have singular, you have dual for two people, and plural for more than two. So the dual, he uses muslimaini laka. Yeah, or our Lord, make both of us those who submit to you. So he's still thinking about his children, even in all these supplications. So the second supplication, make us those who submit to you. In other words, make us those who are following or on that road, that highway. Muslimaini lak. And then he makes another dua. Wa min dhurriyatina ummatan muslimatan lak. This is a very interesting dua. So the first he says, oh Allah, the two of us make us Muslims. Then he says, oh Allah, from wamin dhurriyatina, from our children, make an entire nation that submits to you. What is he talking about here? Our children. It's father and son speaking. But then he says, dhurriyatina, our children. So now he, this shows you that his instinct is so powerful and deep. He's thinking so far ahead. Now he's not only thinking about Ismail, but he's thinking about if he were to have future children, and if Ismail were to have future children. So he says, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا Who's na? Ibrahim and Ismail. From our children, the two of us, and subsequent children that we will have, oh Allah makes so many of them submit to you 
that they can be called Ummatan Muslima, a Muslim Ummah. This is amazing. Just think about that for a moment. You know, he didn't say make many, many Muslims among our children. He said make so many people among our children that they're an entire nation. He wanted everyone to be guided. He wanted everyone to have Iman. He wants all of his children and subsequent progeny to be guided. And he asked for Ummatan Muslimatan Allah. And we know these du'as and supplicate were so powerful of building the house. Everything we have today is a result of those supplications. Today, what are we called? We are called Muslim Ummah. And that is that du'a. All goes back to that du'a. We are sitting here in this masjid today because of that du'a of Ibrahim. Ummatan Muslimatan lak. Ya Allah, wa min dhurriyatina ummatan Muslimatan lak. From our children make, and the children of our children make, an entire nation that submits to you. And that entire nation as a group that submits to Allah is no doubt the Muslim Ummah. And because we are descendants, our Prophet was descendant of Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam. So, and that's only because of that powerful, powerful paternal instinct of Ibrahim. His desire to continue this legacy of faith in himself till his last moment in his children and in the children of his children. And then he continues making dua. And the next dua is the most powerful. He says, Rabbana wabaath fihim rasulan. O our Lord, raise from them one messenger. Who is them? It's his children. So you have to think about it. you have to put it in context. He's still thinking about his children. So first he asks himself to be guided, to be accepted, and his son to be accepted. Then he wants the children of both of them to be guided and be Muslim. And now he says, he goes, his instinct is so powerful, his desire to carry on this faith for his children to know Allah is so powerful. He says, from my children, all these children, let there be a nation, but from them let there be one person that you select that you will speak to, that you will teach him the book and the scripture and he will purify the rest of them. And he's still thinking about his children. And we know this is the great dua that culminated. And the answer of that dua was our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He was an answer to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He was the chosen one from the children of Ibrahim almost 60 generations later from the descendants of Ibrahim, someone who was selected by Allah. This verse we all know is speaking about our Prophet But this is a dua that Ibrahim made thousands of years before. And it's only because of that paternal instinct that he was like that. And because of that powerful paternal instinct of Allah, from this passage we have all of these great things in our life. We have the city of Mecca because of that, the Kaaba because of that, we have our Ummah because of that, and we have our Prophet because of that paternal instinct. Wamin dhurriyati. All begins with the words, Wamin dhurriyati. Now, the rest of the passage, just to summarize, it gets even more powerful where Allah says, If qala lahu rabbuhu aslim qala aslam tu rabbil alameen, wa wasabiha Ibrahimu banihi wa yaqubu ya baniya. So then, now, the next verse, Allah speaks about the wasiya of Ibrahim on his deathbed. وَوَصَّابِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ يَا بَنِيَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى لَكُمُ الدِّينِ فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Ibrahim and Ya'qub. So the verse says, Ibrahim and Ya'qub gave this last will and testament, this wasiya, to their children that Allah has chosen this way for you, so do not die except in the state of Islam. The same verse we began with. So this verse appears in the context of Ibrahim speaking to his children and giving them this advice for what? Istiqama. Staying on the road until your last day. This is exactly Iman and Istiqama. So now, think about who is Yaqub? The story is about Ibrahim, but in this verse Allah says, وَوَصَّابِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ بَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبُ It's a beautiful device where, you know, 
Prior to that, Allah is speaking about Ibrahim, and then he includes Ismail. Now he's speaking about Ibrahim on his deathbed, and he includes Yaqub. Who's Yaqub? Who remembers Yaqub in relation to Ibrahim? Okay, and who's Ishaq? Yeah, so Ibrahim had another son named Ishaq, and Ishaq had a son named Yaqub. So Yaqub was Ibrahim's what? Grandson. But not through Ismail. The story, the passage about Ismail, now Allah shifts to the other son who is going to come later. And his, he jumps to his son's son. He doesn't mention Ishaq, he mentions Yaqub. Just to give you a more powerful image that Ibrahim's instinct to preserve his children and Iman was so powerful, it extended to everywhere. Not only Ismail, but also through Ishaq. And only went through the next generation as well. So now in this verse, Allah shares, like there's two generations apart. A grandfather with his grandchild. Ibrahim and Yaqub both making the same testimony on their deathbed to their children. Yaqub speaking to his children. These are the great ch grandchildren of Ibrahim. And Ibrahim speaking to his children. So Allah skips a generation just to give you an idea how deep and powerful that tarbiyah and the instinct of Ibrahim was that his whole family was blessed to be prophets on all sides to different wives and even not only his children but the children of his children and the children of the children of his children. And what, it, what was their singular message to their children upon their deathbed? O our children, Allah has chosen for you this deen. And stay with it until your last death. There's nothing about worldly life, about wealth, about palaces. Take care of this estate and that estate. Don't forget about this farm. Don't forget about these things that we eat. Don't forget about this account. No. Only one thing that you need to be concerned about. And that is the iman. Staying on this path. That's the idea of istiqama and the idea of... of Passing it on behind, be, beyond your death. So last week we looked at Iman and the idea of you staying on the road until the end of your life. Today we're looking at um, beyond your life, trying to pass on that in your children and the children of your children. So that Iman continues. So Allah wants us to have deep faith and everlasting faith. And He wants that faith to continue beyond our death through our children and the people we train. Now, one last verse. Continuing, Allah says after that, Am kuntum shuhada'a, in the same passage, Id hadara Ya'qub al mawtu. Now Allah goes beyond to Ya'qub. Now Allah shares Ya'qub on his deathbed. He already mentioned his general dua, but now a little bit more detail now, just Ya'qub. Am kuntum shuhada'a, Id hadara Ya'qub al mawtu, Id qala li banihi, ma ta'buduna min ba'di. Were you there? Witnesses when Yaqub was on his deathbed and he said to his own children, Who will you worship after me? So Yaqub, the grandson now, Allah sharing his emotion and his sense and his passion. And you can see it's the same passion as Ibrahim. On his deathbed, Yaqub, death is Hadara Yaqub al Maut, death is at hand. And he gathers his children. And he asked them, he tests them, who will you worship after me? And what did they say? Qalu na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha abaika Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa ilahum wahida wa nahnu lahum muslimun. They were raised properly. They were recipients of the dua of their great-grandfather great Ibrahim. And they were recipients of this great legacy and this great instinct of passing down Iman from generation to generation that they answered in the right way. They said to their father Yaqub, we shall worship your God, the God of Ibrahim, the God of Ismail, the God of Ishaq, our forefathers, our family. We will worship them and we will submit to him, we will worship him and we will submit to none but him alone. This is the great training of the believer a believer is to think about beyond your death. You have to train your children. You have to pass on this torch. So many people in this land and around the world, you know, they want so much good for your children. But you look at the wrong things. 
you look at building a nice house, you look at putting them in the best colleges, but how many people are thinking about Iman? I came to the U.S. in 1972. In the 70s, it was a terrible situation. Like most of my generation, the parents were obsessed with giving the children the best education. So almost entirely my entire generation, everyone we knew, they had come in the 70s, was mostly pharmacists. And their only passion, concern was to make their children doctors. Every single one of the people I knew from my generation, they were put in the best schools, private schools, back in the 70s and 80s. And they got the best education, they became doctors. There was le very little concern about Islamic education. Was, there were very few massages at that time. But I didn't see that same passion for Iman. There was no concern, it was just about this life. It's just about education. And we lost an entire generation because of that. And that story repeated beyond that after that generation after generation. Perhaps even now, you see that everywhere. We worry about giving our children the best education, but we don't worry about what we really need to worry about. And then what happens are tragedies. So many tragedies in the world today. People you all know, they're examples of these tragedies. Like the, you know, um, there was a Kenyan Muslim, Muslim brother. He came for an education here, he married someone, he, and they had a child, and he put his child in the best schools. Then he went back to his country, they separated, he left his child behind. He gave him the best education, he was a bright child, but he didn't give him Iman. And that child became the president of this country, Barack Hussein Obama. His middle name is the only thing he got from his father. Did his father have that instinct for Iman? His grandparents, his, his family on his father's side, they're Muslim. They had no concern to pass Iman to their child. And what a tragedy that is. Look, you know, he's a brilliant person, not the best person. We have tremendous differences with him, but the biggest tragedy of his life is his father was Muslim. He didn't have the chance to get Iman. But his father made sure he went to the best schools. And the same thing if you look at Steve Jobs. His parents were Muslim too. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, one of the most powerful companies in the world. You know, someone like that, someone as brilliant and accomplished as that. His parents were Muslim, they worshipped Allah. But they gave up their child. They didn't bother to pass on that Iman, that torch, that istiqama wasn't there. So this story is repeated again and again and again throughout the United States, throughout the world, where parents are looking at the wrong things for their children. From the story of Ibrahim, the dua is, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِ رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِ Oh Allah, make us establishers of salah, i.e. make us worship you, and from our children, those who worship you. That's the only thing that matters. So this is the du'a, it's a continuation of the idea of istiqamah. So, iman is the most important thing in our life, but we have to have istiqamah, which is holding on to that iman until the end of our life. And then today we looked at, you have to have the idea of beyond your life, the idea of istiqamah in others, and passing on that to others. So may Allah give us the tawfiq to do that, may Allah help us preserve our children, may Allah give Iman to all of our generations and the subsequent generations. May Allah gather us on the Day of Judgment. Um, you know, it's very, very scary if you think about the future. How many of your descendants will be Muslim? Will there be descendants of yours that share your blood, but they don't know Allah Azza wa Jal, and you will not get to see them? That's a scary thing. So may Allah protect us from that. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. That, if there's any questions or comments. Barakallahu So the question is specifically about teaching children Qur'an and there's a lot of emphasis 
um, by some parents on memorizing the Quran and not a similar emphasis on understanding the Quran. So how do you see that? So surely that's a great problem. Uh, first of all, the problem we're talking about is much deeper, not knowing Allah Azawajal. So this is a good problem to have. Your children are in the masjid memorizing Quran, our parents are putting them there. That, alhamdulillah, is way better than what we had in the 70s. That situation was entirely different. Um, you're talking about in the 70s, people didn't even go to the masjid. There were no masjids to go to. People did not. Ramadan would come and go and the family would not even know there was Ramadan. Sometimes we would get a call. My father uh, tells us he would get a call for some friends. Oh, I heard Ramadan was coming, um, you know, the month of Ramadan. When is it? And my father would say to them, it passed last month. So people would live in these suburbs and just lost. So that's an entirely different situation than today. Today, alhamdulillah, the resources are far different. The institutions are there, the masajids are there. So it's not as bad as that time. So we say alhamdulillah for that. Uh, now coming to this idea of memorizing Quran. So um, it's, it's a little complicated. Um, surely the children should be taught to understand Islam and understand the Quran. That's more of a priority than memorizing. But however, when children are very young, there is an age where children memorize like the arithmetic table. They memorize you know, the elements of the periodic table. So there's an age of memorization where you memorize things, you kind of understand some of them and many of them you don't, but that's the age of memorization. But then as your uh, journey continues, you start understanding those things. So that's perfectly fine. So children can memorize and then eventually in their stage, they would understand that. So that's a natural progression of knowledge. However, there's, there, for some reason, there are many situations where and memorization is there, but that next part never comes, and that is a huge problem. That next part never comes. If you have Islamic schools and madrasas and um, our children memorize Quran and they go through all this education and then they don't understand it, even later in their life and they become adults and they don't understand it, that is not only a tragedy of the highest proportion, but it's a crime of the highest proportion. That means you didn't do justice. All this time, you sh definitely could have imparted that education. That's shows a lack of priorities and understanding. So for some people, the Quran is just a miracle book. It's a book to be recited. For many cultural Muslims, it is merely something like a magical spell. You just recite it on certain occasions and it has some powers by reciting it. It has nothing to do with the meanings. And that's not the case. This whole deen is about guidance. And the power of Allah's words are in the meanings of Allah's words, not in some the way they sound or some musical formula or in their tone or all of that stuff. So shortly um, we need to do better in some of these institutions, but overall it's not so bad, alhamdulillah, but we always have to emphasize the meaning of the Quran, but obviously when someone's three years old, that's not the time to learn the meaning. That's a stage where you have to learn basic surahs. So you still have to teach basic surahs at a certain age without understanding, but then part of your curriculum, part of your syllabi, part of your efforts in all these institutions that next stage has to come and there has to be some way of doing that. Wallahu a'lam. What can be done? It's a good question. So, so the issue is, so I, um, without mentioning names, um, so I moved to this area in, in 2003 for my children and uh, for the Islamic education, um, the central Jersey area, and I put my children in Islamic school. All my three children memorized Quran, alhamdulillah. Um, but they went to different institutions, so originally they were in the same institution, then uh, when the institution split, I put my son in one Islamic school and my daughter's in another. And I got to see two different paths. So uh, one of the Islamic schools, and I won't say which ones, and I don't want to mention any names, but one of the Islamic schools, so half of my uh, children, they emphasized uh, meaning and understanding much more than the other one, uh, but the memorization was not as solid. 
So that side, I saw that like these, these children, they understand much better, they have a better sense of, of the Qur'an, but the memorization is not necessarily as strong and solid. But then the other school, the memorization was solid, and there was an emphasis on that, but then there's zero understanding because to make the memorization solid, what they did in that school was they, they took away Arabic language from the children, so, and they take away Islamic studies. Which now looking back, I'm, now this is in hindsight. Again, I was there, I had no idea. It was part of the problem too. But looking in hindsight, looking back, I see both uh, uh, approaches and I see the problem. So on this side, the memorization is solid for the people coming from this institution. But in my own children, um, the understanding was almost zero. Like no understanding of the Quran itself, but knowing how to recite it proper. So, and when I looked at what they did was that I couldn't understand, I couldn't believe. So you have these people memorizing the Qur'an, so you s to create more time to memorize the Qur'an along with your studies, you sacrifice Arabic language and Islamic studies. So these people are coming out memorizing the Qur'an, not knowing what Islam is, not having a good sense of the deen, and not understanding the Qur'an. And the problem is, the main problem is when you finish memorizing the Qur'an, what do we do? We have an Amin party. We distribute sweets and we did it. And that's it, it's over. The journey ends for us. That's the problem. So most people memorize, they don't go to the next stage because you think that's the end. And our parents think that's the end. So, you know, like these are things for Islamic studies, teachers and uh, people involved in Islamic schools to think about. That, you know, Arabic language has to be part of the curriculum. It has to be there. Uh, cannot be sacrificed. It should never have been sacrificed. So I, you can take longer to memorize, but there has to be Islamiyat and Arabic language along with that. That's much more healthy than to memorize in two years or three years because most children, after they memorize, the, what happens is most of the parents, what they do is when the children memorize, then they immediately take them out of Islamic school, put them in public schools. So that's it. They got the hif hifs, and now they go to sub public schools. So the Islamic education doesn't really... Uh, expand. It's a generalization. I mean, I see that in my family and in a lot of people, it, but every school has exceptions, so I'm not trying to say it applies to every single person coming from these institutions, but these are generalities, so, you know, we have to think about that. And also, you have to think about, is memorization so important? Now, you know, I believe there was at some point in my life so I memorized by the age of 40, and my wife memorized, and I made all my three kids memorize. Um, I mean, we force them at a young age, it's not really their choice, but eventually it becomes their choice. But looking back, we lost a lot of time. Right? Looking back, I don't think the priorities should have been like that. And what's the point of memorizing Quran, especially for many people who will never be Imams? Um, they will never recite the Quran or lead prayers. They just know the Quran, they forget it. So maybe time would have been better served to understand the deen and to spend that time in other pursuits and to learn fiqh and learn like hadith and learn all of these things. Allah alam. I don't have an answer, I just have reflections based on my own life experience. So memorization of the entire Quran is a less of a priority in my mind than it used to be at this stage in my life. And memorization does not have a lot of value without meaning. I also believe that now. It's really the meaning. The memorization is just it's kind of like, you know, you have computers that can recite back to you, like, what's the real value of memorization? You know, of course, there's value to knowing the words of Allah, but that's a spiritual barakah value, but that's not really the essence of the Qur'an. Wallahu a'al.
So the question for online audiences, um, there, Brother Harun mentioned that there are some studies that show that children have their beliefs formed by the age of eight. So this kind of belief system is established in the minds much earlier than we, we used to think. So at that very tender young age, what are the things that we should be focusing on as Islamic educators and parents in terms of tarbiyah? So actually, we, I, some of us, we ask this of our own teacher, Sheikh Akram Nadui, Hafidhullah. Uh, what should we be focusing on for our kids? Like in terms of the Quran, what parts of the Quran? And so he actually gave us a basic um, syllabus that I can share with you of like what are some important surahs and stories that are age by age, from this age to this age that we should be focusing on. But alhamdulillah, the Quran has tremendous like resources. Uh, Quran has a storytelling style that works for all, every age. That's the beauty and power of the Quran. It's so insightful for people at our level and people who are much more advanced and it's also for children. Uh, the same stories work for children. So, And some of these basic stories teach you basic morality and good and evil and who Iblis is, who Adam was. And So at every stage of a child's life there are, there are things that you can focus on. But uh, for sure in that early stage the stories are much more important, especially the basic stories of creation and shaitan and jannah and jahannam and things like that. Um, so inshallah I'll share you, it's a Quranic syllabus age by age for, very, for the very young. So I'll try to find it and I'll share with you. Okay, jazakallah khair, inshallah. We see you all next week, may Allah accept from all of us.